So welcome all. Thank you all for joining us today. I hope you and all of those who are close to you are keeping safe during this time and these challenging times, of course. I'm Rob Vember. I'm the Senior Advisor with the Global Business School Network. For those of you who are joining us for the first time, the Global Business School Network is a purpose-driven organization currently comprised of over 100 business schools in over 50 countries and we're across six continents. Our collective purpose is to improve management and entrepreneurial skills in the developing world. So please join us at gbsn.org to learn more about the organization and getting involved with the work and the projects that we do. Today's cross-border webinar, Recruitment During a Downturn, is presented alongside our partners at Hired EFMD Shared Career Services. I apologize in advance for any uh, glitches that may occur. As you know, we're, we're all at home. I imagine many of you are uh, participating from home today. Uh, all of the panelists certainly are currently in our home. So uh, apologies in advance for any, any technical glitches that may occur. The session is being recorded and will be made available to you in the coming days. Automatically, you will receive an email with the recordings. Please feel free to utilize the chat function at the bottom of your screen if you'd like to submit questions or address all of the panelists as and when we'll go along. We'll try and, of course, address um, many, if not all of those comments and questions as we work our way throughout the course of the hour. The Q&A function is also available to you. We'll get to a lot of those questions towards the latter part. To those of you who are joining us for the first time, a big welcome to you, of course, a welcome to our members as well. We've got such a broad array of people joining from Lahore, Pakistan, Nigeria, Lagos, Tanzania, um, Poland, all over the show. So we really appreciate you joining, especially if you're in a, a far off uh, time zone um, from where we're broadcasting from today. I'll keep the introductions brief. Of course, you would have seen the bios of our panelists for today. Uh, so just briefly, Francisca Irvalt is MBA and International Engagement Lead at SRA Careers at SRA Business School. And uh, they are, of course, GBSN members as well. They have been working, uh, she's been working in higher education for over 12 years and holds an undergrad degree, MA and MBA, done in three different languages, uh, I might add. Uh, she's been working with SRA in Barcelona for over seven years. Amber Wigmore Alvarez is a Chief Innovation Officer at Hired EFMD Shared Career Services. Amber brings more than eight years of experience from the world of global career services at top ranked IE Business School, who is also an AGBSN member, and uh, she was Executive Director of Talent and Careers at IE. Amber is a Doctor of Economics and Business Science, holds an International MBA from IE and a BA in Hispanic Studies and International Economics from Wheaton College in the USA. David Sirs is HRVP Southeast Asia and South Korea for leading pharmaceutical company at Beringer Ingelheim. David studied labor law at the University of Barcelona and took an MBA at ESADE as well. In 2002, David joined Beringer Ingelheim in Spain, later moving with, within the company to South America and then to its headquarters in Germany. And since the end of 2015, he is based in Singapore, which would explain uh, why it's rather dark where you are, so, uh, David, compared to the rest of us. But welcome to you all. Thank you so much for, for, for the time that you've um, provided us for the hour. And in advance, thank you for all of the insights. Francisca, if I can start with you, you're kind of in the middle of where Amber and, and David are, are based as far as workflow is concerned. Can you just talk us through, broadly speaking, what things are like at Asada at the moment and, and how your job has, has morphed and changed over the course of the last couple of weeks? Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me, Rob. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm super happy to be able to share some insights and also hear uh, from more people what they are going through. And, you know, share pain is in the end just, just half of it. And uh, maybe we'll get some inspiration um, on how to better deal with this, all of us. Um, I decided we've moved basically everything online, be that classes or our careers activities uh, from day one. Um, the only exception there is maybe the executive programs were uh, postponing activities to really uh, do the, yeah, the activities in person once they be, they're able to resume. But right now, basically, our, our undergrads and all our full-time programs running online, also respecting different time zones because we have loads of international students in all our programs, especially in the full-time MBA where we have actually over 95% uh, international students. So we're dealing with people who maybe went back to the American continent in that time zone, others uh, being in Asia and Oceania. 
So we are we're really adapting everything as far as, as possible in terms of our content, in terms of our availability. And we must say that, um, yeah, we, we've seen a really positive response that way. Of course, we understand uh, students are really missing out on, on things that they signed up for in a full-time program where you are expecting interaction with your peers, with professors and everybody in person. So that kind of personal touch, um, we really hear that, that people miss it. And that's really, really a challenge uh, for everybody involved. Um, we have a lot of conversations, uh, both with the companies and the students, and we're putting them together. We've done industry summits that have been very successful, that not only involve the student community, but also alumni and either um, as well external guests so from other schools. So we've seen a lot of solidarity that way, a lot of connection. Um, and I would say that's basically the silver lining, so to say. Yeah, and we, we want to drill down into these industry summits and, and the career fairs. The FMD is hired is doing a massive virtual career fair. So we want to try and get as, as specific as we can, um, just for everyone else tuning in. We've, we've of course, got loads of careers of officials, um, admin um, staff at different business schools, but we also have a lot of hungry, eager students wanting to know, you know, how I land the job. So, so Amber, I'm pretty sure at Hired, your, your kind of rate of, of work has, has increased exponentially over the course of the last few weeks. Exponentially would be the word, Rob. Yes, yeah, so we've seen how COVID-19 has dramatically impacted higher education in general, forcing schools to adapt to online learning uh, overnight, basically, in a matter of days. And we've done exactly the same in the world of career services, in the world of recruiting, uh, our mission has always been to accelerate the matching of the talent in our network in the FMD. We have 689 schools in 91 countries with the thousands of recruiters with whom we work around the globe. So now that the current crisis has put a stop to on-campus recruiting, physical career fairs, that, that result is basically short-term. That is a result of the current crisis. But there's a longer term trend going on now, which we have seen over the years, a decline in student participation in on-campus fairs, at the same time, recruiters as well. So this has simply accelerated that. Now on March 24th, we did a pilot, uh, and given that we have our office and our team in Shanghai, and they've been experiencing this since January, we did our first virtual career fair for China specific, March 24th, and it was a phenomenal success. We had 153 participating schools, 54 companies, the majority of which came on as a result of the schools introducing us to their partners, and 1,700 students participating. What we saw here was something unheard of. Now, on average in the world of re recruiting, we talk about a 25% conversion rate, in our case at Hired, between talent when they look at an opportunity and then click to apply. Now, the talent who participated in this online career fair for China and attended their webcast throughout the day and then saw their job opportunities and applied, it's between 64 to 66%. So if we look at IBM Watson, which has a conversion rate of 32%, and we're seeing rates of 64 to 66%, uh, you wonder, will we ever go back to that on-campus recruiting? So we quickly accelerated from there, from March 24th, and we are now looking at a full spring series and fall series of virtual career fairs, both sector specific and geographic specific, uh, at which we will have at least 100 schools participating as we kick off the next fair, which will be next Tuesday, April 28th, specifically for Europe, Middle East and Africa. That's an all sectors fair. Next week on Thursday, April 30th, we'll have the all sectors fair for APAC. And then we get in every week, we'll be doing EMEA and APAC for the specific sectors. FMCG, retail, luxury, banking, consulting, energy, industrial, uh, and the list goes on. And so then we'll be replicating again in the fall, expanding to North America and Latin America regions. And so we're just seeing how, uh, how this goes so much more hand in hand with recruiting in general, and I'd be eager to hear from David, because if you think about an online format like this, where you don't have the talent just going 
by a physical stand where you're very limited in terms of the number of recruiters who can be there. But at our virtual stands, each company can have up to 10 recruiters manning the stand. Uh, 10 recruiters who can choose to be profile specific, who can be representing their different countries, so much more efficient. The talent are at the same time applying directly into their applicant tracking system. Uh, and if we consider that companies using applicant tracking system softwares, it's seven, more than 75% of recruiters or 98% if we're looking at Fortune 500 companies. So you think oh, this has really accelerated that, uh, the physicality versus the virtualness of, of hiring. And I, I, I'm finding that I believe it's going to be difficult to go back to the way we were before. Yeah. I'd be to hear the recruiter perspective. Yeah, absolutely. And, and we'll certainly be sure in the follow-up email to share all of the details and direct you towards uh, Hyatt's uh, career fair. And we'll, we'll, we'll dig a bit deeper into that as well. Uh, David, I'm interested, based on, on, on what Amber said, the conversion rates of, you know, students applying, um, you know, students are looking for jobs. So I, I accept that. But what I find interesting, implicit in, in what she said, we, we, you know, we set this up on the premise and we're all operating under the assumption think rightly so that we're facing huge economic uh, downturn coming up um, you know all talks of recession around but companies are not all necessarily behaving the same as far as hiring practices are concerned i.e they're not all just shutting down shop uh, what is the case with being Ingelheim at the moment okay first of all uh, thank you for for inviting me and welcome everyone very happy to be here as you said I'm from Singapore is pitch dark outside, so that's why <laughs> the setup is a bit dark also inside. Um, well, um, in a world where sometimes the word strategy is a bit overused and overrated, if you want to, uh, talent acquisition activities are truly a strategic. Uh, strategic because it's not only you bring skills uh, into your company, which might uh, eventually uh, become some revenues, but also because it's the opportunity to shape your culture and the ethos of the company by providing, by getting different types of, uh, of uh, profiles. So in this crisis, um, well, you need to look at this from different multiple dimensions. As you are very well saying, not all the sectors are impacted into the same, uh, the same way. So today I was uh, listening uh, Mercedes-Benz, for instance, they dropped their sales in Germany by 80% in the last quarter, 80%. So it's huge drop, right? When you are in the pharma sector, actually, uh, you look at things slightly different. Uh, there are still patients, uh, and the patients, that they need medicines, and, the, and, if, and the, the pets need also vaccines. And you need to be able, as a responsible employer, to provide this. You need to keep on supplying the market because patients need from this. So when you look at the recruitment, you need to look at this at how is it uh, your business, is it impacted? How do you expect the business to be impacted? You need to be careful uh, probably in looking at the next uh, batch of hirings uh, just to be sure that you can fully operate with them. But definitely you need to be careful in just freezing or cutting down or something like this, because the world, although after COVID-19 uh, will be different, uh, still there will be a world. Still there will be customers. Still there will be skills that companies uh, need, products to launch. Uh, so all of this, you need to factor it and eventually take uh, the best decisions possible in a situation which I would say there's no precedent. So sometimes you need to try an error if you want to, uh, but still you need to keep on looking forward, not immediately uh, short term. And how quickly have you been able to, you know, adjust terms of reference, think of those new ways and you're, at, you're in a lockdown right now. Are you able to hire someone and they're starting immediately to work remotely mm -hmm. from home? How, how quickly? I know oftentimes in the bigger the organization, seemingly the longer these things take, but how quickly have you been able to adjust? Okay, it's a, it's a very good question and um, very good question. And actually it depends a bit of the country combination if you want to, because different countries have different, different situations. Um, definitely we are exposed to situations unprecedented. 
Um, today, unfortunately, you cannot travel to many countries. And in regions like Southeast Asia, where uh, diversity is uh, paramount and it's, uh, it's the diverse region, I would say. So you need to bring innovative solutions. How can you onboard people who had to move from example, uh, Philippines to Singapore, if the travels are not possible, uh, the restrictions make you not possible to, to bring these people. So we have, we have need to come up with uh, creative solutions in those cases. If we are talking about within the country, um, luckily uh, 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 there are plenty of uh, technological solutions which you can use uh, in order to make that onboarding uh, not the same as if you are onboarding someone in your facilities, but pretty comparable experience. In a way, we have been testing some things that we knew we, we, knew we have. Uh, however, we are uh, really maximizing uh, its usage because there's no other, other way to do this. We are even onboarding people. We are not even able to provide a computer, but we are onboarding them just by simulating a desktop, company desktop, et cetera, et cetera. So you can do many, many things. And now is the time to be innovative, to be creative, and to ensure that still you provide the best experience possible to every single new employee. Fran, have you, in your role within career services, have you approached differently just in terms of, you know, or mentally preparing students for a different kind of uh, interview with the likes of David or, you know, different kind mm -hmm. of onboarding, as he said? How, how have, what has your experience been just in the last few weeks with students coming with those kinds of questions and concerns? Well, it's a, it's, a, it's a very interesting question that you're raising. I think uh, one of the questions that was out, outlined in our description for this webinar was, if the increase in the pool of the talent will change the dynamic between the graduates and the recruiters, right? And the quality, quantity will change the quality. So what will matter more, I think, is the quality of interaction. So what we've observed already, and I think it's going to be amplified and as Amber also said, accelerated, being accelerated in our era right now, the processes are online, so they're probably faster and harder. So companies are trying out these tools for recruitment, and they're seeing that, as Amber said, they're pretty successful with that. So are they all going to go back, or is it going to be a luxury to be able to interact with people in person? And when you have this kind of interaction in person, maybe at the very end or just when you already got hired, um, what you have to focus on, I think, is a human-to-human -human interaction. And this is something we're definitely uh, strengthening in our communication. And that's not only for recruiters. I think we're forgetting oftentimes on all levels that when we're talking to each other, we're talking from human to human. And uh, maybe when we put labels like, oh, the recruiter, oh, the student, oh, career services, um, we forget that there is a person behind that's going through a challenge these days. And no matter who will wear and in what circumstance, if you're alone, if you're family, if you're in Singapore, if you're in Germany, if you're in, in Barcelona, you know, the situations of lockdowns are different, but I have yet to meet a single person who's better off now than before. So I think what unifies us and what could make us stronger is acknowledging that we have something in common, that right now we're all struggling on different levels, in different ways, with different uh, strengths. So. I would really like to take this opportunity and remind everybody that when we talk to each other, no matter if it's between a student or, and us or the recruiters, that we're talking from one person to the other and that we're on a, on a common ground there. And I think if people are uh, really using this as an opportunity to connect at a human level, and if you really feel that the student is, is uh, reaching out as a concerned person rather than just a job seeker, I think this will make a difference. So it's not anymore just if you can thrive in an assessment center that's online. It's also on when you reach out, do you actually ask how the other person is coming, uh, coming along with the situation? You know, I think we've talking, been talking a lot about physical hygiene and washing our hands, but we're not talking about emotional hygiene yet. This is something that I'm missing in this whole conversation that's going on in all these weeks of identifying our own emotions and as a job seeker, as a student, acknowledging but hey, you know, I'm, I'm scared. And if I'm scared and I'm unsecure, maybe it's easier for me to, to kind of isolate myself and go out and say, hey, what can you give me? And of course, as um, different institutions, we can, we can give a lot and we can adapt to this. 
but in the end it's going also inside and say okay how am i feeling and I, am i in a good place to be able to you know have a quality interaction with somebody so i think this quality interaction this really human connection is going to be even more important than before that is only on let's say the emotional level and of course there are going to be skills other than let's say the emotional self-regulation that is going to be hugely important not only as a job seeker but then as a professional being able to manage people you know especially talking of the mba so you're going to be the leaders of tomorrow uh, really having people that you know you can rely on in a, in a leadership position is going to be even more important tomorrow than it is today so if you can deal with this in your situation right now this crisis can come up as an opportunity for you to be able to have these conversations with recruiters convince them that you're able to manage it right now and that you're able to manage others who are going through similar situations in the future because this is not going to be one up we're going to face other challenges in the future so apart from that the change management you know, digital skills, because we all have to work on that right now. And autonomy, you, oftentimes you don't have your boss sitting next to you right now, even virtually. You have to be able to come up with this. So for reaching from this kind of, you know, emotional self-regulation, digital skills, uh, change management skills, autonomy, resilience, and collaboration, I think this is going to be even, even more important to be able to highlight that and that it comes across. Now there's something not like a bullet point on your CV, but actually in the way you approach others. And just before I ask Abba to comment, but just a reminder in the chat box, you're welcome to send through your, your questions or comments as well as using the, the Q&A function uh, at the bottom of your screen as well. Amber, practically speaking, these moments that you're creating through these career fairs and linked to the, to the question I just posed Fran, how are those, what do those interactions look like? You're giving a, a, you know, a student 10 minutes with a potential employer. Practically speaking, what does it look yes. like? Yes, excellent question. And if I could just tie that question into David's response and, and Fran's response, we're very much all learning together now. We're, we're suddenly going through these processes and needing to learn. Not only the talent, absolutely, and we have been doing now for more than a year monthly master classes on career education topics where we would have on average 1400 students uh, from more than 250 schools and 65 geographies we did two classes over the last two weeks the last two had more than 2000 attendees we have another master class today called how to succeed at a virtual career fair we now have a record more than 3000 students and alumni are registered for today's masterclass that I'll be moderating. And what we're doing today is walking them through those 10 steps of what you just asked me, Rob, how can I be effective? I will now have this 10 minutes, the chats are typically say on average 10 minutes where you can be engaging in a public chat or a private chat. How can we ensure that they've done the research ahead of time on the companies that will be there on the opportunities uh, and when they visit a virtual stand, it's actually an extremely efficient process just by the mere fact of having their CV uploaded to their profile on our virtual career fair system. As soon as they go to visit a virtual stand, you are leaving your profile details and your CV with the recruiter. And they can actually, before they choose to engage with you in private chat, they can see exactly, do you have the organizations they're looking for? Do you have the language skills and that experience? Uh, and so that makes it so much more efficient. No longer are you walking around, milling around a career fair. You might see 30 students waiting in line in front of one booth. It doesn't work that way. These stands, as I mentioned, can have 10 recruiters who can each be engaged in multiple chats at the same time. There are no queues. It simply does not exist in the system. What could happen is that you may go into a chat and might have to wait a little longer for a recruiter to respond to you. But at the same time, how effective is it that if you are a mastery management profile or you're an experienced alum, that you would be able to speak with the recruiter in question at that stand, or if you're targeting a specific geography. So the interactions during the day of, uh, we include public and private chats. They include the talent being able to look at the job opportunities, apply directly. They can attend the webcasts that the recruiters the participating companies will be holding throughout the day on the platform 
There will be seminars, which are pre-recorded videos. Uh, this is just an example. Uh, and the idea is to get them to the next stage. And that's what we're doing in today's masterclass is how can they craft their effective ele elevator pitch for to wow that recruiter in that small amount of time in those chats? Uh, how can they go with their CV already optimized uh, for the applicant tracking system scan? Uh, knowing that your CV, just by visiting that group, will be going directly into these companies' applicant tracking systems. You want to make sure that it's ATS compliant. You want to make sure that it has ATS readable fonts, that the sections and headers can be parsed by an applicant tracking system. Uh, so just small ticks, tricks and tips like that, uh, that many, uh, many of the talent never even considered before. But at the same time, we cannot forget the recruiter perspective. I always talk about the recruiter stakeholder. If it weren't for the companies, well, we wouldn't be career centers. We would not be our global job board or have these amazing virtual career fairs. And we were talking about, David, the onboarding of the new talent coming into uh, Bowringer Ingelheim. At the same time, let's think about new employees coming into the human resources department. And we talk about now internally at Hired, the job of the future is a digital recruiting specialist. So there are specific skills that the recruiters and the human resources professionals, uh, it will be more sourcing. It will be chat, just think about ability, the chatting abilities. I, the more students are able to chat with effectively during these virtual career fairs, the better they will be able to source. So we have now converted the first two events next week, April 28th and April 30th, to we have invited the recruiters on a complimentary basis on behalf of our schools. They're welcome to have a complimentary virtual booth because we suddenly discovered that the major multinationals that we work with, on average 10,000 employees, uh, we're talking about the world's top workplaces in many countries. Uh, we discovered that they do not all have experience in virtual career fairs, something that we expected that they would they, they simply don't, or maybe their company participated in the past in another region, but not them in particular. So we've been doing a lot of work with the recruiters in onboarding them for this experience to get them prepared. And this is why we've actually converted the first two fairs out of the series and we'll likely have a total of approximately 30 this year uh, out of the 12 in the spring series. The first two will be actually behind the scenes without the talent realizing it. There'll be training events for the recruiters to get their feet wet when it comes to the employer branding imagery that they would have on their stand. Uh, and what are they putting in those chats? And what kind of webcasts are they scheduling throughout the day? Uh, how will they be then viewing the, the visitors' profiles, exporting the visitor profiles? How will they get them into their talent pipelines? So for those companies not necessarily hiring right now, but looking to build those pipelines for fall recruiting processes. So it's very much a learning experience for all of us. Uh, and it's, it's a very exciting time because it, as I mentioned, it's been accelerated, but the more we get deeper into this, the more it complements so well what appears to be the future of recruiting. The online assessments that many of the companies, uh, up to 70% of companies have our students and, and alumni going through. The online video interview, so what we're doing in today's master class is actually tying together previous master classes that we've done on those topics, the online video interview, uh, the uh, online assessment solutions, game-based assessments. Uh, so the use of game-based assessments in recruiting processes. Uh, so for candidates to understand why would recruiters use this, what are the advantages for the recruiter, how are there ways to, the common question on behalf of the talent, are there ways to beat the system and we don't we don't teach that but we teach the reasons why recruiters use this and the reasons why it's important to be honest on those because you're doing a disservice to yourself if you're trying to beat the system or having somebody different do that for you uh, so ultimately the idea would be uh, to, to continue along these lines and we do get a lot of questions from our schools right now about the fall um, and because they still many schools do have the hopes of having on-campus recruiting events in the fall, though there's a lot of uncertainty there, uh, and are wondering, oh, so if, if we have these events, should we then stop offering the virtual career fairs to the students? And I'm, I'm, 
uh, hope I, I don't want to say I fear, but I, I strongly believe that um, on both sides, we're going to see some tremendous advantages in efficiencies. Uh, and if we think about where so many of our schools are at now with blended learning and part-time programs and students all over the globe who are limited from attending physical fairs in the past, this makes so much more sense. Now you were able to open up virtual career fairs and that matching to your talent, no matter where in the globe they are. And David, to, to the point that Amber has been making about recruiters and ensuring that recruiters, I guess, are, are up to speed as well with the, the change in times. How much time have you spent, presumably with your team or internally at Bringer Ingelheim, making sure that your HR departments are kind of with the times and, and, and are changing the way they go about um, looking at students and evaluating students in, in what's essentially just a virtual environment? Well, we have been, uh, there's been a, a bit of a journey uh, in this part of the world. Um, in, my, in my role, I have uh, the responsibility of uh, seven countries. So we have been changing the approach to recruitment from the more traditional recruitment approach to a RPO. So basically, our recruitment activities are handled by a specialist agency who really help us a lot in, uh, in tackling those um, those uh, segments of uh, potential future employees you want to tackle. Regarding the students, our, our, I mean, um, our approach is more still going to the school, not asking the students to come to our company. Uh, there, there are different sizes in our region, um, but we go to schools and definitely we, note, we have noticed that there is a lot of traction. Uh, uh, students, uh, Many people actually, but the, but the students, they feel they want to work for a company with a sense of purpose. Uh, sense of purpose is one of the most powerful drivers uh, nowadays. And if I can say this, particularly for young people, also for elder people, right? But, uh, but for young people, it's, a, it's just kind of, I want to do something which is really meaningful. And when you work for a pharmaceutical company and that company is strongly based on ethical principles, and you work in the area of, uh, of uh, helping humans and animals uh, to, to improve their lives, really you get a lot of traction, a lot of traction. Every time we go to a, a school or university, uh, students, they come uh, you know, massively. Um, and I'm saying this very humble because it's a, for it's a privilege, but uh, recently we're in one university here in, uh, in Singapore and the, I mean, and the person who was in charge of the school said, wow, I mean, you guys uh, really made the difference uh, because that sense of purpose matters. And then uh, graduates, young students, they want to belong to a place where they can do something uh, which matters, which is relevant, which has a, a set a sense of purpose. And there's a question that I'd like to pose to you along those lines as well from Muhammad Idris, uh, David, his I guess premised on the fact that the lockdown situation and the downturns will have a grave impact on recruiting processes in organizations in terms of quality as well as the quantity of human assets. Do you think this is going to affect the overall productivity? Do you, do you see a, an effect on, on overall productivity as a direct result of the hiring? Productivity meaning in terms of uh, how fast and how efficient we can hire, I guess. Um, if this is the parameter, I would say, well, there will, it will be interesting to see how the situation evolves. Definitely, this, uh, the current situation, the restrictions in some countries uh, to get uh, foreigners or even getting flights uh, probably will, will make the workforce to be potentially more local if you want to. So in a way, it's a bit of a hit, for, definitely for the mobility, and consequently uh, for the uh, diversity, at least in terms of geography. Um, once uh, the restrictions are lifted, we hope to see again uh, this kind of uh, mobility, which again, it helps to shape diversity and inclusion in, in, in teams. Uh, but for a while, I believe uh, that you will see this kind of more within countries type of recruitment uh, because the circumstances force you to go to go there. And Fran, to Amber's point of you know recruiters gamifying 
a lot of the recruitment processes on a practical level how much are you walking your students through those kinds of, of processes well um we have we have kind of two approaches we have on the one hand platforms that are digital already and they support them because they can just do tests and uh, keep on learning from them and of course then we have the one-to-one -one interaction or one to small groups or trainings that we do in class so there's going to be like always this this kind of twofold approach but yeah we've definitely seen uh from different sectors that our employee engagement team is interacting with that even sectors that were more hesitant and more traditional let's say to uh include these days uh online mechanisms just because it's a bare necessity and they're kind of enjoying it for me it's um interesting to see that like online assessment centers, um, they, will, they will come like new models that we haven't seen before. And it's going to be interesting and if they're going to be very different from what we've seen so far. And I think gamification is going to be just getting more and more because in the end, if you're having fun, then you forget about <laughs> all the struggles um, and you're in a, in a better mindset to actually show who you really are, right? And uh, maybe you forget about trying to, to take advantage of the system as, as Amber was saying. Um, so it's going to be interesting because um, right now it's, it's still a bit of a, a test phase for a lot of recruiters in a lot of sectors. And uh, I think some skills can be tested um, easily or more easily than others. But um, it's going to be interesting to see from my perspective, not how well the selection process is going to work, but how well the retention is going to be afterwards. So a little bit in line with what I said earlier on based on the human interaction, like are you going to be able with those online tools to really also have the matching when it comes to company culture. So um, like I think it's going to be very important to see that not all tools will, will fit all companies. So I guess the companies that can allow uh, will, will have to personalize that very, very much so and uh, really work with psychologists on, you know, being able to actually we do valid tests on not just recruiting, but really having the right kind of talent. So this is also a bit of a question to, to David from my side. It's like, how, how do you think um, that is going to work in the long run, not just in the short run? And um, yeah, similar to what David said in his case, um, our sectors also have the impression that, of course, because of travel restrictions, apart from very strategic positions uh, that, we, that we still see getting hired, uh, in some of the sectors. Um, a lot of it is going to be more localized, at least for the time being. And um, yeah, I think that also requires uh, some flexibility and adaptation to short-term plans and take advantage um, of the opportunities that are uh, there right now um, to, really, to really work in a, in a mindset of, okay, this is my short-term plan as a student, this is my mid, and this is my long-term plan, and this is how I can get there maybe not in one step. If I want to do a triple jump as a, as a candidate, maybe I'm starting with um, a short-term plan that's leading me piece by piece to where I actually want to go. So yeah, it's, it's, in the end, it's going to be a, a response that's going to be in, in pieces uh, from the recruiting process to um, where they really want to go. And adaptation, I think, is, is really key there. So. Yeah, I hope that uh, everybody will make um, good choices in, in that sense and, and clever choices in the short and in the long run for themselves. Yeah, I must, we, were, we were wondering before we got on whose four-legged uh, baby was going to walk in the, in the room first. <laughs> but we got a two-legged one, David, so <laughs> you were in the pool on that one. Um, Amber, have you, in your conversations with, with the recruiters, and, and I'll get to David on this as well, I think there's an assumption from students that they are on the back foot because of, well, there's generally going to be a bigger pool, of course, competing. Mm. And, and maybe the assumption that comes along with that is it's the you know, highly technically skilled MBA grads or MPhil grads or people who are very, you know, they have the tech part down as far as their technical ability. Um, but of course, all of that working from home, you need a lot of that emotional uh, EQ as well to be able to still communicate with, with your colleagues who are in, in different places. 
have, have you had any sense from, from recruiters how much more attention perhaps they're paying to the EQ element as opposed to just the, I can technically get this done as quickly as possible? To be honest, the focus right now for them seems to be, uh, well, first of all, we've seen a number of internship programs being uh, transitioned to remote internships. Uh, so there is still an incredible need for certain companies and specific sectors, specific departments to connect with the graduating cohorts. There is more need than ever to continue with the employer branding for those that may have had to cancel current processes, but we are still hoping and expecting to be hiring again in the fall. So uh, just to bring this back a bit uh, to, to what David was mentioning just a while back where, uh, David, you said you went to, you're still doing the on-campus visits and you went to the campus in Singapore and uh, we, we work with the top schools in Singapore in our network. Uh, and I, I think another thing we're finding now is the recruiters are, they have started to realize the, the beauty of working with a platform that allows you to connect with the students across all institutions without having to go campus by campus. And at the same time, not limiting yourself so much to, yes, for sure, there are, is talent that is the right fit in terms of skills and corporate culture that you're looking for on those campuses. But at the same time, and just say, for example, say it, you're targeting a Singaporean, there could be a Singaporean studying at Babson, for example, in the US looking to return home. So it's about being able to connect the recruiters very quickly and efficiently with the target talent. And the most important thing right now is relevancy. And so more than the EQ, the EI, uh, which has always been important with the companies that we've been working with through these years. Uh, it's about the continued need to, uh, and, and Fran was saying with the same thing with the quality of those connections. It's about when talent is approaching a virtual stand, them having in their profile their work permit authorizations, their language capabilities, their experience, and connecting efficiently with those recruiters who have opportunities for them at this time, or who may have graduate or rotational programs for them when they graduate. And it's about making it a so much better job hunt experience for the candidate and allowing the recruiter, it's, I, I, for the recruiter, it's no longer do they want to be flooded with 10,000 applications. Uh, and what happens through our platform, for example, we are not LinkedIn in that sense, There's where you can get excellent volume. Uh, we specifically, we've always focused on what Fran is saying with the quality and, and the relevancy and the latest in AI matching technology. So very much based on the users and the student and alumni behavior and where they're clicking and where they're applying uh, and what they have in their profile. So it seems to be especially now that need to be connecting directly with the relevant talent, not creating any false expectations. And that, that we have seen, uh, yes, there may have been companies that would have liked to have participated in the, the, one of the first fairs. And they said, actually, right now we are downsizing in one department and for our employer running, that would not be appropriate. We want to be at our sector specific fair on May whatever. Uh, so it's about uh, having, allowing them to do the employer branding when the time is right, but connecting them with the relevant talent, not wasting anyone's time. And, and that's always been very important for, from an employer branding perspective. The candidate has long had that feeling of uh, applying to a black hole and not hearing any feedback during the process. And one of the things that we're going to be seeing here is that increased need for relevancy. It's connecting the talent wherever in the world they are with the recruiters at that right time, going through the processes more efficiently. Uh, and ultimately, it will be a matter of looking at when, when we do come out of the situation, what will end up staying from what we've seen accelerated and, and the things, the changes we've been making. How many of those schools will go back to on-campus fairs, seeing that now we can invite all of our talent across blended programs 
And as a matter of fact, uh, some of the most relevant for these recruiters may be experienced hires. They're around the world currently working, uh, passively looking, but if they do have an opportunity to connect on any device, uh, in between work, on a break, in between classes, no matter where they are, uh, it's, it's very effective. So it's, uh, it's, this is, it, it's really a very exciting time for us uh, in the world of talent and careers, those of us who are extremely passionate about what we do, uh, because it, we, we believe that uh, there are a lot of positive, uh, we'll see a lot of positive results coming out of this that hopefully will ultimately result in, uh, as Fran was saying, the retention um, and the churning or the rotation, seeing those rates go down. And we know that when game-based assessments are implemented, you do. You do see a reduction, uh, oftentimes from 30% down to 10% the, of the rotation uh, in, in the candidates. And you do see um, better contributions to diversity and inclusion because you're eliminating the unconscious bias in the processes. And we have so many, talent is fundamentally international. Uh, one third of the talent are, we would classify as international based on where they're studying and where they're from. Uh, and not all talent is equally as savvy or comfortable in approaching recruiters and meeting recruiters. Uh, these new formats are allowing them to meet one-to-one -one private chats with a recruiter and have them face-to-face -face or then move it to the next stage of getting to that interview, that online interview. Uh, so we may ultimately even find uh, a better fit in the end and a reduction in that rotation and churning. I want to, in, in the remaining time, get around to, to talking a bit more about internships. But before that, uh, David, just a chance to respond to some of what Amber said and, and a question that ties in uh, regarding competencies from uh, Saeed Salim Sadat um, wants to know, you know, the kind of top competencies that, that you're looking for. And of course, this would vary depend, dependent on the, on the position, but perhaps I can amend it slightly and, and suggest, are you currently considering other kinds of competencies in addition to the technical competencies because of the distance? Yeah. Um, I mean, before answering this question, I'm going to answer right away. But uh, one thought that I have listening to the other panelists, uh, Francisca and Amber, it is uh, um, when I'm thinking about particularly young people who, who are starting their career, um, one very important piece of advice from my experience is uh, just jump, just take the opportunity. Don't wait for that golden opportunity. If you are interested in a certain field, just put your foot in it. Perhaps it's not the best, uh, it's not the company forever in your career, probably it will not. Even if you think that's the golden one, it will not, but just jump, start, get started. Companies, we, what we really value, it's, it's the competencies, your personality, but bring us some kind of experience. It's very difficult to get started. Once you start, things start rolling well. So jump, just have the courage, start the job, learn, and then you might open up a completely different set of opportunities for you. That's one of the elements I want to share. To the very question, well, um, when you are looking for a, uh, a recruitment, you need to have, a, uh, you need to very mind two, parameter, two parameters. One of them is the team, the other one is the individual. So, so when you are recruiting someone, you need to understand uh, what does that team need in terms of new recruitment, how the new recruitment will help in building the chemistry in the team, will help in building synergies. It's like colors. So you have a palette of many colors, which colors are you missing in there to be even more efficient, a stronger team? When you look at the individual, of course you look at the technical skills, right? You have to, but guess what? The majority of applicants, they have the technical skills. Who is applying for a job and they don't, not having the technical skills? It's by default will be there. So what companies we are looking, it's uh, who are you? What's your degree of agility, entrepreneurship, open-minded, um, um, potential for more, attitude, values. These things are very, very important. In a changing world, like the, the one we are living in, what you really are looking for is this kind of personal skills, if you want to, personal competencies, which will make you succeed 
in whatever environment you are in. In December, who was thinking about COVID-19? Who? I mean, the Chinese, that little province in there, nobody else. Today, the entire world is there. Who is able to survive? Who is able to write that book nobody has written so far? The one who is able to do this, that one will, will win, that one will be leading the pack. And, and this, I mean, all what I'm saying, if you are able to find the right capabilities in the individual, that's what makes companies often to decide between someone or somebody else. Fran, I think to David's excellent point of jumping, just jump, get your foot in. Part of the problem we're seeing now, and, and uh, one of the questions that came through uh, um, someone from the McDonald's School of Business at Georgetown in, in registering for this webinar was specific to securing internships. Because of course the internship is often what, what students on any, at any level, whether MBA, MPhil, undergraduate, whatever the case is, mm -hmm. that's often the first opportunity students look to, to jump, to get their foot in, to, to create those connections. What, is, what has your been experience been thus far in, to, in terms of COVID and, and, and your corporate partner's willingness to still continue forward with remote internships? How, how have you had that kind of conversation with them? Very mixed pictures, to be frank. Uh, it's, it's very dependent on their location. As I said, uh, it's also the company's location because we're dealing with international students, international recruiters. So we're moving at different speeds here. There's no, there's no one answer. I think it's a perfect question for an MBA answer. It depends. Um, <laughs> so it depends, of course, on the market as such, where they're located in terms of the region. It depends on the sector they're working in, and it even depends on the function. I mean, while we see some functions going down, maybe in marketing, um, others like uh, customer relations or business analytics, communications may be rising, right? So, or, or general um, like internships that are preparing for the recruitment of full-time positions and leadership positions. So um, in the end, there, there is uh, no one good answer really. It, it depends on so many factors and it goes down to even the company, that one specific company in that location, even if headquarters might be on a hiring freeze, there still might be opportunities in a certain location, as I was also hearing in, in last week's seminar, I believe. So um, there's, there's really so many factors to consider that way. Um, yeah, in, in the end, uh, I think it, it comes back to there are opportunities out there and there will be opportunities out there. And maybe apart from the summer internships that are very traditionally organized in, in many sectors, there's going to be off cycle opportunities. That's what I think. And if it's not a formal opportunity, what we encourage students to do is actually look for opportunities themselves, create them. So let's say craft your internship as a kind of theme there. And um, the, the students that I've seen being really successful with that in the last years, they were to, the ones able to leverage their network in the end. And of course, this could be alumni network, but this could be also people you've already interacted with in the company. So not necessarily the recruiter, but on the business side. So yeah, this is a crisis. So that means there are also opportunities. So how are you going to be able to help these companies or these professionals um, in this situation, maybe you have a unique skill set that you can apply and create an opportunity. Um, there's, of course, a, a, let's say a fine line between, okay, I'm working on a project and maybe it's not formally an internship. And that means I might not get remunerated from that, but it might help me in the future create an employment opportunity and being exploited um, and taken advantage of. So, so that's definitely something to explore. But if you're working on a project that helps you overcome a skill gap, so getting started, as, as you were saying, uh, David, so getting your foot in the door, getting started, getting some kind of experience that creates pointers on your CV for the future, I think you're still better off doing that than not doing anything. Are you having to, maybe a bit of a cheeky question, but are, are you having to, in addition to, to coaching your students, kind of coach recruiters as well to, to maybe change their mindsets in terms of how they even envisage this can be done from a remote perspective? It depends a little bit on the agility of, of course, of sectors, but I would say it's, it's not so much some 
something that we would do. It's something that is a lot in the hands of the individual student and their personal personal connections to really make them meaningful in that way. Um, what good use is it if I say, hey, here's a database of projects that can be done, like action learning projects, that, that's certainly of a certain use. Um, but is it not going to be more powerful if you create that opportunity or co-create co that with the person in business, not with a recruiter, with a person in business who's already working on that? Is it not going to be more likely to actually lead to something in the future and terms of full-time position, right? And this can be done online. So I think this is in the end where the power of the network has to be utilized. And we're, we're doing that as schools um, and specifically in the study, we're currently uh, preparing a campaign also to reach out to our alumni community and say, hey, is there something that you consider students could be working on with you um, in one or the other way? So be it a formal context or let's say a project-based context uh, to foster learning. And uh, maybe this has been more common, more frequent in, in sectors like social impact before. But I think this is going to be an opportunity to, to showcase your capabilities, your ad adaptability, uh, other skills that you have. And, and going back to yeah, the quality of, of the human interaction of saying, hey, how can I help you? You know, that's a very different approach of, hey, what can you give me? So, yeah, that way it's it's, let's say, a universal uh, education experience uh, on all ends, of course. Um, but it's, it's a little bit about opening our minds and, and seeing how we can all make the best out of it. And I don't know if you read that article, I think it was in uh, Financial Times about this is a situation of grief that we're going through. And we go through these phases of acceptance. And if we're very good at it, we actually might use this opportunity to create a new purpose. And this purpose nobody can give you. This purpose you have to develop yourself and this is the great opportunity i think we have there well, with, with just a few minutes left maybe amber just quickly on on the point of, of internships and you know working on projects uh, yes. what is the situation with with hide and the platform and just in terms of mm -hmm. how, what you've heard from from organizations yes so just from a personal perspective we do host interns and we have been contacted by uh in particular one of the schools of our interns uh, just strongly encouraging us to continue uh, those processes and those interns on a remote basis, internships on a remote basis, which we have done. I've been contacted by more schools in our network that are offering their interns on a remote basis. And really, I my word out there to the recruiters is to encourage them to be open to those opportunities because we know that experiential learning is fundamental for the talent. Uh, it was, uh, just exactly about one year ago, we did a, a random sample asking our international talent in many of our schools if they felt future ready uh, to go out into the workforce. And from approximately 20 different countries, different degree programs and disciplines, the, there was an overwhelming no. It was a great academic experience. We did not have enough practical employer connections, experiential learning, um, consulting projects, business cases, and challenges. So that is another thing, be creative. If you do not have an internship opportunity per se, perhaps you have uh, a challenge, it could be, or a project. Um, I'm a professor myself. I, you can always use a research assistant uh, to continue, continue publishing in the academic world. I'm always telling my students, uh, no matter what your area of interest, approach faculty in that department to see if they need any assistance with research, get that experience on your CV. At the same time, I have seen schools proactively, schools and deans, in particular global alumni relations departments, reaching out to their alumni, calling out to the alumni to, we need your help. Uh, we need your help making these connections for our talent who will be graduating and need to make these connections. Uh, so I, in the case of my alma maters, uh, I have proactively received that communication. I can tell you, Esade, uh, Fran, I know that you're doing something uh, very good because of, of the talent that we have registered for the virtual career fairs. Esade is one of the highest numbers of students and alumni registered. So the schools very much, communication is fundamental now. Uh, social media teams and one of the things that we are doing uh, for the first time we have now identified in so many of our schools in the nearly 100 participating schools in the future is it just speaking with the career services but we're speaking with the communications department 
they are working directly with our communications department, our social media team, because that is what the talent is looking at these days. These, the, this information, it needs to be on Instagram, it needs to be on Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, more so than ever. We have a captive audience, so let's use that attention in the right way. So that's a couple of the ways that we're working with and encouraging the recruiters to continue with those opportunities, continue being present and doing that employer branding for when you will be hiring again uh, and keep that talent in mind. Train yourselves on these digital recruiting skills that you will need going forward, no matter what happens in the future. Uh, we know that many of the processes that we're implementing with this new technology are, are here to stay. Fantastic. And on that note, before we say goodbye, just, just a few things to note. Uh, Amber did include the uh, URL in the chat box, but we'll be ensure to include it in the follow-up email uh, following this webinar as well as to how you can reach out to Amber and hi at Higher Ed. And of course, all of our speakers' profiles are listed at gbsn.org with links to their LinkedIn profiles if you'd like to reach out to any of them as well. I think they, they, they'd welcome that uh, as well. So next week on Tuesday, we've got Building Online Learning Communities as our follow-up uh, cross-border webinar, exploring how we enhance peer-to-peer -peer learning when programs are suddenly 100% online. And this is an exciting opportunity as well in terms of continuing to build your resume and, and, and fill the time, so to speak, if you're looking for different opportunities to get your foot in the door. Uh, this opportunity together with uh, our partners at MIT, it's the Africa Takes on COVID-19 Challenge. It's a virtual hackathon happening May 1st through 3rd, so as soon as next week, uh, that will convene multidisciplinary teams to collaborate on developing innovative and implementable solutions that can help address the COVID-19 crisis uh, across Africa. This is part of a series, so I encourage you to go Go to covid19challenge.mit.edu or just get to GBSN online on Twitter or GBSN's Facebook page. We've put all of the details up there as well. So a big thanks to uh, Francisca Irvalt, Amber Wigmore Alvarez and David Sirius for all of your time and especially Amber to you and your team at Hired uh, for helping to, to convene uh, the panel as well. I really appreciate it. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Thank, Thank you. you. And thanks to all Thank of you for your engagement today. As I mentioned, uh, the recordings will be made available in the next uh, day or two. Stay safe, keep safe, keep your loved ones close and wash your hands and keep your safe following <laughs> as well. Uh, good morning, good afternoon and good evening from wherever you are joining us today.